Hi, this is Marcia. And this is Kelly. We are the two U's of Two U's Fiber Adventures. Thanks for stopping by. You'll hear about knitting, spinning, dyeing, crocheting, and just about anything else we can think of as a way to play with string. We blog and post show notes at two U's Fiber Adventures.com. And we invite you to join our Two U's Fiber Adventures group on Ravelry. I'm 100 Projects. And I am Better in Motion. We're both on Instagram and Ravelry, and we look forward to meeting you there. Enjoy, Enjoy the, the episode. episode. Hi, Marsha. Hi, Kelly. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and I have some great news for us. Oh, good. I love good news. Well, <laughs> the thing that I wanted to let you know about is um, that we have so many more listeners over the mm-hmm. last few weeks. In the month of July, we've had the most downloads of the podcast that we've ever had. We had we've had 5,000 downloads for the month of July. Woohoo! I Exciting. Know. Yeah. I, and July's not even actually over yet. As we are recording I, this right now, it's still in July. I don't know how that compares to other fiber-related knitting podcasts, craft podcasts, but I'm excited about that. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think we're one of the smaller knitting podcasts, mm-hmm. but I do listen to a podcast from uh, Libsyn, which is our podcasting host, information about their product and also podcasting news. And one of the things that they do is statistics. And so Mm -hmm. they say that for an episode that's been up for a month, if you have 1800 downloads for that episode, you're in the top 20% of podcasts. Mm -hmm. Now we're not quite there yet. We have maybe 13, 14, 1500, uh, depending on the episode, but we're close. I mean, that's amazing to me. We're one of the smaller knitting podcasts and we're, I mean, okay, we're not serial, but we're almost (laughs) in the top 20% of all podcasts. Nobody gets to be serial. Only (laughs) serial gets to be serial. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Yeah. So I'm just so amazed by the knitting community and the support that we've had from our listeners. And I just, I, I just think it's pretty amazing. Most of our listeners are from the United States Mm-hmm. But we also have listeners from the UK and Canada, Australia, Sweden, Germany, Norway, New Zealand, Brazil, some from China, Poland, Mexico, Egypt, India, Japan, and even Iceland. Wow. I know. Wow. Unbelievable be- to me. Isn't this so cool? <laughs> I know, so cool. Yeah, I love that, and just that the internet, the international aspect of it is uh, very cool. Yeah, it, it's just amazing to me. And I again, I thank everybody for for taking the time to listen to us um, and for being part of the two use fiber adventurers. Yes, <laughs> thanks for joining us on our adventures. Yeah, yeah, it's it's been great so far. So yeah. I also have one other thank you that I wanted to um, give a shout out to Dagger Fifty One for making a contribution to the podcast. She went to the blog and clicked on the donate button and made a contribution. So thank you to uh, Dagger Fifty One Dagmar. And thank you. Yes. All right. Now that we're done with the good news part of the podcast, what good news oh, do you have about we, your projects? Oh, I, I thought maybe we were going on to the bad news. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, Marcia. Okay. We got some bad news now, Marcia. <laughs> no. Well, I, guess the, I really have not been doing very much knitting. I mean, I, but I have been working sort of little bits, but nothing like I normally have been doing. But anyway, I, I have been making progress. The Tour de Fleece, I've been spinning, and I've now spun and plied all of that golden Shetland that I bought at the Black Sheep Gathering. Oh, wow. That's um, quite a bit. Yes, I think I got 10 ounces. That's a lot. Okay, cool. And uh, so that's all spun, and I have ready to go now sitting in the basket next to the spinning wheel is the um, unknown uh, wool roving that I bought at the Pendleton Woolen Mills in Portland. So that's my next thing I'm going to start um Spinning. Okay. And then I'm making progress on the Havasu Falls Shawl by Allison Losicero. In fact, I'm working on that now as we're sitting here. 
My other project I've been working on uh, is the, well, I haven't even started the knitting part of it, but the I'm calling it Frank Spirit Yarn Afghan, and this is the Garter Squish Afghan by Stephen West. And I've talked about, but this is the one where I'm using my father's old sweater as the main color. We had a whole discussion about the math the last time, so. Right. <laughs> um, but part of that discussion is I need, I ended up needing 14 skeins of contrasting colors to make up the yardage that I need. Mm -hmm. And so I had 11 and I needed three more. And I had three skeins of undyed mystery yarn from the Goodwill. Well, one of them is not mystery. It's a Cascade 220, just in a natural color. Um, I have not dyed that one yet, but I had two other skeins. They were not mystery. They actually did have labels on them, but they were old from the 50s. And I, those are the two that I dyed. And I dyed, I wanted a like a bright apple green chartreuse limey color. Mm-hmm. So I, that one was very successful. I dyed that one about a week ago, I think. And that's my first attempt at, other than the over dyeing down at... At Dorstadt? Thank you. <laughs> Jorstad Creek Dye Studios. But it's the first time I've dyed anything you know, in a big vat. Usually I've been painting yarn or I tried you know, putting it in mason jars and putting dye, pouring yarn around, or, I'm sorry, pouring dye around the yarn. Uh-huh. This is the first time I actually got out the, um, I have a canning pot and filled it up with water and did it the, the way they were doing it at Jorstad. So I did the chartreuse. That one was really successful. But the second skein, I wanted to make coral. And Kelly, you and I did a lot of FaceTiming while I was dying. Yes. Um, Remember (laughs) trying to figure out, like, what colors do you combine to make coral? So you suggested combining fuchsia and yellow, which I did. And I had a beautiful shade of coral. Um, How I tested it was I would just stick a a white paper towel in there and see what the color was. Um, So it seemed like it was great. Put the yarn in there. And the yarn sat in there for 40 minutes. And it didn't really turn coral it just kind of was this kind of a pale terracotta color, kind of. It just never really absorbed the dye. So I thought, and you know, I would look at the water and there's still a lot of dye in the water, but I thought, well, maybe I just need to add more dye. So I kept adding more dye, adding more dye. And I thought it was getting a little more coral, but nothing like what I wanted. But I thought I, it was quite bright. And so I thought uh, more kind of an orange. I thought, well, maybe if I add a little bit of black, it'll sort of make it a little bit muddier and like a little bit dirtier color. Mm-hmm. You know, I want it not so. So I add a little bit of black and immediately the yarn turned gold. Wow. And it's, it's actually really a pretty gold and I will use it. It's not a bad color at all. Just not what I was trying to do. So I took it out and I put it in a vinegar bath and then I eventually washed it. But then the, when the dye pot, the water had cooled down, I went to throw it out and I realized not all the fuchsia dye was in there. It never, I mean, I knew that there's still a lot of dye mm-hmm. that it was, that the yarn was not absorbing the dye, but I realized what it did is it absorbed all the yellow and the black, but it did not absorb the fuchsia. Interesting. Very interesting. So that yarn was, um, the label I looked at it because I, I almost thought, gosh, maybe it's not even wool because <laughs> it is an right. old yarn from the 50s. And then I looked at it and it's, yes, and I had done the ma- you know the match test on it, the burn test, plus the label says it's 100% wool. It also said it was moth proof. So then I thought maybe that moth proofing has something to do with it. Mm-hmm. So I looked up moth proofing and what I learned is that they, this is very popular in the 50s. Well, actually this process was developed in the late 30s, early 40s. And what they do is they add a pesticide called Mitten FF and it's M-I-T-I-N and then just the letters FF. It's used only on wool. Um, and what they do is they mix that in with the dye And in the dyeing process, they add that pesticide, which prevents moths from getting after the wool. And you can't wash it out. The pesticide just stays in that wool. And I I looked all over the internet. I spent quite a bit of time researching this, and I cannot find anything that says, you know, yarn with the Mitten FF pesticide in it that you can't, that it will not absorb color. Um, it's just talking, there's lots of articles about, is it toxic? Mm-hmm. Uh, lots of articles about what is it, but nothing about over dyeing. But I'm wondering if maybe that pesticide has something to do with the fact that none of the, the fuchsia absorbed. Yeah. Now we need mindful, we need mindful William to weigh in on this because he knows <laughs> so much about all of this. The um, chemistry, yeah. Yeah. But it was interesting Very just interesting. reading about, I, I went to the EPA, they, on their website, they have an article about mitten 
and it, I think they use the term slightly toxic to mm-hmm. birds, moderately to slightly toxic to mammals, and moderately toxic to fish and aquatic invertebrates. Hmm. But you can't wash it out, which is interesting to me. It must attach to the molecules somehow, attach yeah. to the, the molecules in the fiber, which would explain maybe why the dye couldn't attach to the molecules in the fiber. Yeah. And I was reading articles that was, it's, it's not just yarn that they, it's actually sweaters too. So it's very popular to older sweaters from the forties and the fifties and the sixties. If you'd buy a cashmere sweater, they were often treated with mitten. And huh. that actually says that on the label because you have such an expensive fiber. Yeah. You really do not want moths in your cashmere sweaters. Right. Right. Well, and back um, then it was even, it was more expensive than it is. It's more, yeah. I think it's more prevalent now and more. Yeah. Wow. And, it, and, and also in the forties, fifties and sixties, we were, um, pesticides are our friends. Right. We were, <laughs> yeah. you know, we had a different attitude about pesticides. They were good, right. you know, right. um, now we and so there's lots of articles about the health hazards of lots of conver- conversations about is the mitten a health hazard? Okay. The general consensus is no, it's not a health hazard. Uh-huh. But there's a lot of conversation about it anyway. But the other thing I just wanted to add too is that my brother, being mm-hmm. in the design business and selling fabrics and carpeting and all of the, the products that he sells, he said that um, you can actually have your carpets moth proofed. But they don't use mitten. What they really do is they put them in a, a salt bath or a, a spray a salt solution on the carpets, which is not toxic. Interesting. How he knows about this is you remember the carpet that you, I don't remember how you got your dining room carpet. We, you, you got it through us somehow, but I can't remember the connection of um, the carpet in your Marilyn. dining room. That's it. My friend Marilyn, it was her carpet and she gave it to you guys. Mm-hmm. And so we had it shipped down to you, but there had been some damage, right? They had to stabilize yeah. the edges. Right. And so we went to, I don't remember the name of it. I shouldn't even say it, but some carpet place in uh, Santa Cruz. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And they stabilized the carpet. And at that time, um, there was the question, did you want it moth proof? Oh. And my brother a- and Mark, Mark asked the question, will they have dogs? Is there a problem? And they said, no, because it's a, it's a salt spray they put oh. on the carpet. I wasn't so even that's- part of that conversation. I didn't even know that they had talked about that. Interesting. And like your carpet doesn't need to be moth proof because it's in use in high traffic areas. Mm, It's exposed to it, to light. It's, Mm -hmm. you know, the carpets that are in dark places, unused places, that's the issue. Right. Right. Like the carpets in your house is not, they're not an issue. But, um, if you've had your carpet moth proofed with a salt solution, when you have it washed again, it'll just come out. Oh, it's not. Um, Yeah. Okay. That will, that makes sense. It's not permanent. Right. Yeah. Interesting. So I thought that was, so I thought that was really interesting. I don't have my question answered about over dyeing. So I'm just deducing that that is the reason why that dye would not take. Yeah. But, uh, interesting. Um, anyway. So yeah. Do you have another skein of that, or did did you use all of those skeins? I only had I only had the one skein. Okay. Now the other one I had was a different yarn company, and it did not say it was moth proof. Mm-hmm. So what I should do is I should just. I don't think I have in my stash any that say moth proof. I remember um, that tub of beige, like fingering weight yarn mm-hmm. that I have. I don't. Oh remember. right, yeah. it came from it came from a D stash. I don't remember which D stash. I know because it's in that it's in that Earthbound Farms lettuce container, right? <laughs> right. I that think came from that that's one. from the Knockers retreat. Okay, I think that one has a label that says moth proof. I might experiment. Yeah, just check that. it out. I'd be really curious. Okay. It'd be, um, and you should, and try it again with a fuchsia and see if your fuchsia dye takes. I don't think <laughs> I have a fuchsia dye, but, but yeah, okay. I'll try it with different kinds of red because red is one of those dyes that's a little different than others mm-hmm. in terms of stickiness. Uh, that's not the right word, but, but you know, it's often hard to get it to, to ad- adhere. Ad- there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I was an English major. <laughs> Very good. Thank you very much. Yeah. (laughs) Hopefully in the next week or so, I'll start unraveling the sweater and get, get started on knitting because I'm really anxious to start knitting. Yeah. So that's all I have for, um, my projects. How about you? Well, I, the thing I talked about last time that maybe I'd get inspired to work on that quilt, I have not done, Uh, but I have been doing a lot of thinking about it. So my big project is kind of in the same place as your big project, except you're a little further ahead than I am. (laughs) Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> but I have been I have been working on things. I am participating in the Mother Bear knit along crochet along that the two knitlet chicks have. Mm-hmm. And I had already I talked s- about I my saw, bears. I, I saw all of them posted on Instagram. Yes, I have. They're so cute. A baker's dozen. I did 13 bears and I'm done now. <laughs> <laughs> I have decided I have to be finished. It's mm-hmm. so addicting, but I have other things I need to work on uh, because you can finish one in a couple of days. You know, that's mm-hmm. just very... There's something very satisfying about doing that. And then you can also play around with, oh, I think I'll make her a skirt. Oh, this is yarn that Mm -hmm. I always, I always wanted to see what this would look like knit up, you know, so you can kind of use a bear as a, as a swatch in a way, Mm -hmm. because I have a lot of yarn that it's not like I want to use it to make a particular thing, but I'm interested in what it will look like worked up. Right. And so that's, that's what I've been able to do with these bears. And I was doing some crochet crochet experimentation. The bear pattern calls for you to like crochet around and then chain Mm -hmm. one and turn and crochet back the other direction. Mm -hmm. And then all the star Wars creatures were all done sort of in a spiral where you just keep crocheting around and around and around and never Mm -hmm. turn it. So it's kind of like the difference between stockinette and garter stitch. So I was looking mm-hmm. at what does that do? What does that do to the fabric and how does it look different? And you get these, when you turn and go around the other way, you actually get sort of ridges. I thought that was interesting because, I don't know, people who crochet, probably this sounds very obvious, but I never thought there was like a front and back to crochet. I never thought mm-hmm. about it, but apparently there is. Cause when you turn around and go back the other way, you get a much different fabric than if you just keep going around and around and around. Oh, I did not realize that. Yeah. I and thought it was the same and that, that they, huh, yeah, okay. I did yeah. too. So, so that was kind of fun to, tr- to try different ways of crocheting so that I could see the differences in the way mm-hmm. that the, that the bears fabric came out. So they were fun. I highly recommend it. The mother bear pattern, you have to actually order and then it gets mailed to you. And then that pattern, the price of the pattern helps to pay for the shipping of the bear overseas. So then Mm -hmm. you ship the bear back and the one that you make with your pattern the first time when you ship it back, you know, your pattern has covered the cost of the bear. But after that, you, you, you send $3 per bear to help mm-hmm. cover the shipping and they go to mostly uh, countries in Africa for children who have been affected by HIV AIDS in some way. Mm-hmm. The mother bear group on Ravelry is really kind of cool to look at too, because people post all kinds of pictures of their bears and I had trouble with the faces, mm-hmm. uh, but you can take a look and see how different people did all the different faces. And even though I had trouble with the faces, they all kind of came out with a personality. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, it was fun. I really enjoyed doing all of those bears. Um, and I think it was fun to like concentrate them all in the span of, you know, mid June to the end of July mm-hmm. and just focus on, focus on just making bear after bear after bear. Yeah. They're, they're darling. And then it's really fun on Instagram too. People are posting pictures of their bears with the child that received the bear. Yeah. Which is very cool too. Very yeah. sweet. I have not gone, well, I haven't sent any bears in, so I wouldn't be looking for my own, but there's a website where you can go and you can just look at all the pictures of these kids with their bears. And I have not gone to that site. I've just seen the ones like you're talking about mm-hmm. on Instagram, but oh my gosh. Yeah. It's, it's a really worthwhile, worthwhile charity project. I used to do Linus blankets and then our drop off site for that, um, closed. And so mm-hmm. I don't have a, a, I don't have an easy drop off site. And so I haven't done one in a while, but it got me thinking about, about doing some of, some of that charity knitting again. So anyway, that's, that's the biggest thing I've been working on. And mm-hmm. then I am back to working on Robert's civil war socks. I'm on the second, mm-hmm. I finally cast on for the second sock and I'm about halfway down the leg. Well, maybe not halfway maybe about a third of the way down the leg. I'm on the leg. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been working on that. Is this the north or the south leg that you're working on? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Good point. 
Uh, actually, that reminds me of another little small tangent that I will go okay, off on okay, for a second. Oh, yes. um, the other obsession that besides uh, the mother bears, my other recent obsession has been Ancestry.com. Oh, yes. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> When we were up at the Black Sheep Gathering, Robert's grandparents lived in Junction City, and we went past their old house. And we started talking about his family and all of that. And then we also visited my dad on our way home. You know, we camped all our, our, all the way down from Oregon back to back to Salinas. And on the way, we visited my dad. And he's been very interested in my family's history and has been working on ancestry.com to fill out our, our, uh, family tree. And the thing he's most interested in is like, who, who are we related to? So, mm-hmm. you know, like he'll trace our family tree back and then trace it forward to someone else or like trace two back to see where they meet. And he's pretty much come to the conclusion that everyone in the world is related to everyone else. <laughs> Well, it makes sense. I mean, <laughs> exactly. So, so I'm related to everyone, according to my dad. <laughs> so he gave me access so that I can add to this, this tr- family tree from Robert's family, you know, build up mm-hmm. from his side and connect his family to our family tree. So much fun. Oh my gosh. This program is absolutely brilliant mm-hmm. in its addiction factor. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know who they had helping to design it, but you fill in information and then you go look at your tree and you have a little leaf on a person's name. And that's a hint. They call it an ancestry hint. Mm -hmm. And in the ancestry hint, they have like several different census documents or birth or death documents or something. And you look at them to see if any of them are your are actually your relative. Mm-hmm. And if they are, you click on them and it adds to your, it adds to the facts that you have about that person. And then of course, once you do that, then that means somebody else who is also connected to that person gets another leaf, mm-hmm. right? Because the more information you gather on each person provides you more hints for the other people in the tree. So it's kind of like, I, I'm not really a big jigsaw puzzle person, but it's probably a good thing that we don't because when there is one around, I find myself standing there and thinking to myself, oh, I'll just put in a couple of pieces. Mm-hmm. And you look and you find, you know, and, I'll, and then I'll go do whatever I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. You put those pieces in and then all of a sudden you see other pieces. And then you put those pieces in and then, oh, well, there's some other pieces. I might as well just put those in. Mm-hmm. And pretty soon you've been standing there for an hour doing this jigsaw puzzle. <laughs> that's how this ancestry thing feels. So Mm -hmm. I had to actually, I had to actually, uh, say to myself, you are not allowed to go on the computer tomorrow. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the days that I was working on it. And then when I was allowed to go back on the computers, like you're allowed to go on the computer, but you may not open ancestry. (laughs) (laughs) So funny. So anyway, but but it was very cool. The The coolest thing was that I clicked on something somewhere and all of a sudden it was like Robert, uh, for listeners, that's my husband, like Robert's face was looking out at me mm-hmm. in, from this old, old, like daguerreotype picture mm-hmm. were his eyes looking out at me. It was the yeah. freakiest feeling. and it, And it actually turns out to be one of his relatives, actually a pretty close relative. It was like Hmm. the brother of his great, great grandfather. Hmm. So yeah. And there's a whole town in Arkansas, Locksburg, that was founded by these people. Hmm. So next summer's vacation might be in Arkansas. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So interesting. Yeah. My aunt, my father's sister, who's now gone, she did a family history of my father's side of the family. Um, you know, but in those days she didn't have the internet. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it was a, a, all kinds of letter writing and phone calls and actually getting on planes and flying places to do all the research. And, yeah. um, so I have, um, she typed it all up. It's a, I don't know, it's about a half inch thick document, you know, a 
binder. Uh-huh. Um, and, well, and also she put together a three ring binder with everyone's photo. If she had a photograph or could find a photograph, um, she put that in there. Um, so there was a photograph, you know, attached to their place on the family tree. Mm-hmm. But it'd be interesting for me to take that information and plug it into Ancestry.com. Yeah. Because the other way of thinking about it, too, is not you're, you're getting information for yourself, but you're also providing information for other people. That's right. That's right. If you put plug that in. Right. And now my, my mother's side of the family, uh, my, my grandfather, my mother's father, his family all came from Scotland. Um, and we have, it's another complicated story, but we have a, a, somebody who actually was not a relative, but she married in the family. She did a lot of research uh, about my grandfather's side of the family um, because when they first moved to Seattle, they, uh, um, for years, they owned a shingle mill on Lake Washington um, oh. and made shingles. And for a long time, we had a sh- shingles because they, this is a great, I know I'm really going on a side <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is another Sorry, but this this is this is the danger of ancestry.com apparently. I'm now getting um <laughs> actually Kelly, I think this website was probably designed by a, a drug cartel or something. Um <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to, um, <laughs> or, yeah. um or the, this, is, this the, is or this is how they the model of uh, or the past anyway. version of the people who design uh video games. <laughs> Yes, yeah. Pokemon Go. <laughs> yeah. It was interesting marketing that they did because for years we had um, shingles that had the name of the shingle mill. Their imprint, they printed oh. it on the shingle, and so that's how they passed out information about you about their company. Oh, that's cute. So we, used, we used to have those those uh, shingles, but my mom donated them to the, the museum. Uh-huh. I don't have them anymore, but, uh, um, but, it, but we don't know very much about... Um, my grandfather's side of the family on my mother's side, and we know nothing about her mother's side of the family. Um, mm-hmm. So it'd be interesting to, to the information that I do have. Um, yeah, it'd be interesting to plug that in. We do have on my my mother's mother's side of the family. We have the family Bible, you know, which is about oh. you know, they're like ten ten inches thick, you know. Yeah, and in there, there's a section where you write down everybody right. in the family mm-hmm. and their birth date and the, and if they died and when they were baptized yeah. and confirmed and all this stuff. So I should not now, but at some point, <laughs> I should probably <laughs> plug in all that information for both sides of the family. The yeah. information that I do have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, Sometimes when you when you have lots of free time yeah. to yeah. Uh, dive down deep, deep rabbit holes. <laughs> right. So, but it, uh. it's been very, it's been very interesting and very fun. And mm-hmm. I like, um, unlike my father, whose interest is to see who we're related to. Mm -hmm. Um, my interest is like, what was their life like? And okay, so they lived here and then they moved there and they had this many children and then the Mm -hmm. children moved to this place and just thinking about the lives of all these people and okay, it was during the depression or, you know, oh, it was right after the civil war, just that kind of sort of speculation about, Mm -hmm. about their, their life. So the reason we got off on this tangent was yes, Robert yes. was, what was the, <laughs> the civil, yeah, what the were we civil talking war about? socks and Robert yes. was a little bit dismayed is not exactly the right word, but it kind of hit home to him that one side of his family would have been fighting on the side of the union and mm-hmm. one side of his family would have been fighting or actually was fighting on the Confederate side. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, you know, he's read about it. He knows, he knows about a lot about the civil war. Cause he's done a lot of reading about that time period, but it really was kind of like, Oh, personal, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. when he could see this, this ancestor was in the Confederate army and mm-hmm. these ancestors would have been in the union army. Mm-hmm. So that was interesting. So I'm, I'm excited to finish these socks. <laughs> Oh, oh yeah, we, oh yeah, that's right. We were talking yeah. about the socks. Totally okay. related to knitting because it was all about the Civil War socks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So the other project is continuing. That's the knocker shawl, and now I'm at the point where I'm not sure how many more repeats I can get, or even how many more rows I can get out of the yarn that I have, and I have mm-hmm. to make some decisions about finishing it up. 
Um, so mm-hmm. I'm close to being done. I'm actually close to being done with that shawl. It's it's pretty large. I made a lot of good progress on it, but it's now stalled a little bit because I have to figure out what to do. Um, mm-hmm. But I'll be back to it. It's not something that I'm in a big rush for, but it, that yarn is gorgeous and it's turning out really, really pretty. It's going to be a shawl I get a lot of use out of. Okay, cool. So yeah, those are my, those are my projects. All right. Oh, well, I do have, I do have one other project. I guess it's called a project. I'm not going to count. I might put it in Ravelry as a project. Um, but it was my singles swatch of Palooza. <laughs> oh, yes. So do, do tell about the swatch of Palooza. Okay. So in honor of Tour de Fleece, I started thinking about singles and singles yarn, which is yarn that is not plied. And when I first started spinning, I realized that there was some controversy. I mean, who, who knew there was controversy, controversy in knitting and spinning, right? Mm-hmm. But I guess there is. Anyway, there was some controversy about singles and whether they're good to use or not, or whether you have to ply your yarn. It's kind of a weird, a weird controversy in a way, or a weird thought that you can't use singles, um, that you have to ply your yarn, because there's plenty of commercial yarn that is singles, mm-hmm. like Lopi, any of the Lopi yarns are singles. Mm-hmm. Um, Madeline Tosh Merino Light is singles. You know, there well, are lots and, of different singles yarns. Yeah, and I always had read that the reason singles were not, you didn't want to knit with singles is it would twist your fabric, that you needed the 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 ply, plying the yarn, and then it would put a twist in uh, to balance what right, am I trying to say? you know, it mm-hmm. balanced the twist mm-hmm. by putting plying it, yeah. And so that singles, you can get uh, fabric that is uh, um, twisted and not straight, yeah. But not not true. Well, it actually it is somewhat true, but it's not okay. like a big disaster. It's not okay. the big disaster that people maybe think it is. Okay, okay. There's energy and balance in your yarn. So when mm-hmm. you when you spin a singles, you're putting energy in that yarn in the form of the twist. Mm -hmm. And you can see that when you take it, you know, when you, when you pull it out, it twists back on itself. That's the, that's the energy that's in the yarn showing. And when you ply the yarn, it like balances the energy, right? So you have the Mm -hmm. twist or, or twist. You can think of it as twist or energy and the plying balances that, that energy or that twist. So, you know, when a, once a yarn plies back on itself, it's stable, right? It doesn't mm-hmm. un it doesn't uncoil, right? Um, and it doesn't like kink up. So, so it is true that there's extra energy in in singles that doesn't get balanced by plying. That's one of the reasons to ply your yarn is to get more balanced yarn. In other words, to get yarn with a little less energy. I mean, you can imagine what it would be like to try to knit with something that was all kinking up on itself, you know, it would be really difficult to do that. So that's one reason to ply your yarn. Um, you also get a stronger yarn when it's plied. So it's harder to break. Um, and you get less pilling and Mm -hmm. it's a little harder wearing, right? It'll last, Mm -hmm. it'll be better for outerwear or socks. I, like I would never use singles to make, I, I can't say never, but I probably would not use singles to make a sock, for example. Right, right. Um, but there are some reasons to use singles. Okay, and and I some hear- <laughs> and some ways and some ways mm-hmm. to um, sort of mitigate that extra energy. So first mm-hmm. of all, the biggest reason that I like to use singles is it's faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you only yeah. have to spin it once, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but also, um, and this is especially good for new spinners, you get a lighter yarn. Mm-hmm. Do you remember the first yarn you spun and oh, yeah. applied? It was like, it was like rope. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and so you can get a lighter yarn and, you know, once mm-hmm. you get a little more experience, um, spinning your, your yarn gets not just thinner. I'm not talking about the size of it, but just the density of it. You know, the, mm-hmm. the, the way it gets twisted when you first spin gives you, seems to give you like a very dense, dense yarn. So you have mm-hmm. less, you have less of that dense yarn. So it's lighter. Also, if you have, if you buy colored braids of yarn, mm-hmm. you can keep your colors like they are in the braid instead of when you ply, you know, the colors mix up. Right. 
So those are some good reasons to use singles. And when you want to use singles, you can actually sort of tamp down that energy or you can actually use the energy to your advantage. So how do you tamp down the energy and then how do you use the energy to your advantage? Okay. But you're about to answer that question. I, 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 hope, interrupt I you. hope so because I have four swatches. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so first of all, tamping down the energy time will do that. Of course, the mm-hmm. energy may come back when you wash it because mm-hmm. that sort of rejuvenates it. But to a certain extent, time and and being wound will tamp down that energy and it 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 won't totally come back. You know, wind mm-hmm. it into a ball and let it sit like that for a couple years. <laughs> Actually, no, wait a minute. I thought, I thought this was supposed to be fast. Okay. Yeah. Well, this is what happens when you forget, right? When you forget oh, okay. about your yarn, you were going to use it and then you don't or something. So I have mm-hmm. an example of that. Another way that you can tamp down the energy, actually just washing it. You don't even have to full it, which is what people sometimes do. That's another way. But ju- just washing it will make it a little bit more manageable. And I will put pictures um, in a post. I'll put a post in our blog and I'll link to it in the episode show notes um, where you can see all the different pictures. But for example, some of the singles yarn that I took off the wheel immediately and wound into a skein, I mean, it was crazy, Mm -hmm. crazy kinked up. There was no way you could manage to knit with it in that format. Well, I guess you could, but it, it would be very challenging. But once I soaked it in water, you know, washed it um, and dried it, just and I just hung it to dry. I didn't hang it with a weight or anything. I just hung it to dry. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was really pretty pretty manageable. So that's so that's something that can help. If you need more help than that to tamp down the energy, you can actually fold the yarn or felt it slightly mm-hmm. by washing it with a little more vigor um, or a lot of vigor, depending on how full do you want your yarn to be. And so that will take out, that will really tamp down that energy too and, and stabilize, uh, stabilize the yarn. You can dry it by hanging with something hanging on it. And I don't mean something really super heavy, but even just like a plastic hanger hanging on the bottom Mm -hmm. of your yarn can kind of help to make it the energy tamp down and more manageable. Now, some of that energy will come back when you wash it. If, if, if all you did was hang it, with some weight on it or like I said, put it in a ball and let it sit for a while. Mm -hmm. That will come back when you wash it. Some of that energy will come back, but it's already organized then, right? Once Mm -hmm. you wash it in your, in your garment, the yarn is controlled and organized by the knit stitches. Right. So, yeah. So you will get some biasing and I'll talk about what I got from the biasing that I got in my swatch. You, you might get some biasing. And then the other thing you can do to kind of, uh, tamp down the energy is to not put so much energy in, in the first place. So not put so much twist Mm. in in the first place. So try to spin a really loosely plied kind of fluffy, loosely plied, not highly twisted yarn to start with. Mm-hmm. So those were the thing, the different things that I did, and I made four different swatches. Okay. So first, the first swatch that I made was the yarn that had been sitting for two years in a cake. Mm-hmm. Even when I put it in water, it really did not. I just put a strand of the of the yarn in water and let it soak to see if the twist would come back, and it really didn't. I. Mm -hmm. I had spun this really loosely. I'd intended to use it as a singles. So I'd spun it really loosely. And I made this swatch on a size three needles. It's about a fingering weight yarn, maybe fingering Mm -hmm. to sport weight. And I really got no biasing at all. It was loosely spun enough. And the yarn was just, you know, so unkinky that it really didn't, show any sign of biasing at all. And it's, Uh it's so light, you know, when you don't have those, those plies twisted together, Mm -hmm. I don't know, it just, Mm -hmm. it's so light. So that was an example of, of really no, no, uh, evidence of extra Mm -hmm. twist in that yarn. Then Mm -hmm. I took the same kind of yarn, the same, the same weight, 
you know, I was going to make the same type of yarn. My plan was to use a different braid to make something resembling this really loosely plied, but I put a little too much twist in it because I wasn't paying attention, you know, talking to people and I'd forget. So this one had a significantly bigger amount of twist in it. Mm -hmm. And it was very kinky when I took it off the wheel. It still had like little bends in it, even after I washed it. Mm-hmm. it. It hung pretty straight, but there were places where the yarn was like, like a, when you try to unbend a wire and you've still got the little right. kink in yeah. it that you can't yeah. get out. It's kind of mm-hmm. like that. Um, but I didn't weight it and I really didn't fold this yarn when I washed it. I, I washed it fairly gently. And when I knit it with the size three needles, it came out very well organized, no biasing, really good stitch definition. You don't really see any evidence of that kinkiness. Mm-hmm. When I knit it with the larger size, I went up to a size five needles, and then you can start to see some texture from the twist. And then I went up to size seven needles. At that point, you can really see the energy in the yarn in the form of kind of a texture to the stockinette. Uh-huh. And then did you wash the swatches too? Yeah, I washed okay. the swatches. Okay. So even after washing, you still see the texture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That energy is still there. You know, the, the tighter the knitting, the more organized the stitches are, the less you notice that it singles that has mm-hmm. a little too much energy little too much twist. I mean, this, this yarn would, would not have been the amount of twist that I would have purposely put in for singles. Mm -hmm. You know, I, like I said, I got distracted and I was spinning my normal way I spin when I'm planning to ply, but Mm -hmm. it still, it came out really nice. There's a little bit of biasing in the largest gauge. So the larger the needle size, the less organized it all is, the more room there is for it to kind of bias. Mm-hmm. and tech, you know, show texture. Then another swatch I did, I purposely uh, spun as singles. These are a little larger, like more like a DK to worsted weight. Mm-hmm. And, oh, something else I wanted to say about singles. If you're used to plying your yarn as a spinner, when you look at your singles, you're going to feel like they're super uneven. Like, you, oh, you can't possibly knit with this because it's not consistent. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when you ply the inconsistencies kind of blend together exactly yeah. and average average each other out. Mm-hmm. So you're going to feel like your yarn is really inconsistent. It does not look inconsistent once you start to knit with it. Mm-hmm. The larger your needle size, the more you can see those inconsistencies and the biasing. I used some alpaca that Thumberina gave me, Tracy, from the Knockers Retreat. She gave me some of the alpaca that she was spinning. And again, same the same thing happened. Um, this one, the, the larger yarn, there is a little more evidence of bias in the stockinette. Even at the smallest gauge, there's a tiny, tiny bit of bias, but not super noticeable. The stitch definition is really good, even though it's kind of a fuzzy yarn. And then with the larger gauge, again, you can definitely see more texture and you can, and in this one, you can really see that it would bias. So this would not be a Mm -hmm. good choice for large swaths of stockinette, but I did a couple of lace patterns Mm -hmm. and the lace patterns came out really nice. Um, and you don't have any of that biasing, I think, because you're doing different things, you know, knit two together, leaning left stitches, leaning right stitches, yarn yeah. overs. And so you're getting kind of a, again, a balancing out of things because mm-hmm. the yarn is going in different directions. Mm-hmm. One thing I did notice in the lace was that there are certain sides of the pattern where the yarn overs actually get squished to be smaller. Mm-hmm. But it's consistently that way throughout the lace. Mm-hmm. And so it might, the lace pattern, depending on what lace pattern you choose, the lace pattern might not look exactly like it would look in applied yarn, mm-hmm. but it, it looks good. Mm-hmm. So it's just well, different. Well, I, I was even thinking too, you know, with the, um, when you're talking about the, with the, the inconsistencies in the yarn mm-hmm. that show up as you knit on larger needles, mm-hmm. that could actually just become a design feature too. Yeah. You know, they, um, 
it's not and none of this is bad and it's all just how you want to use the yarn right and uh having seeing that energy in the yarn and those compressed yarn overs and everything you're describing can be a good thing mm-hmm. i mean it, it it can become just a design element yeah and and actually mm-hmm. there's a um, I'm glad you said that because that reminds me. There was an article in an old spinoff that I was looking at as I was kind of researching for this for this swatching project, and the woman who wrote the article knit with singles sp- specifically for the slanting, and then she would do. Um, there were a few swatches in the article, and they would have like she would alternate between using a Z twist yarn. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And using an S twist yarn, and so like if you think about my my swatch that's biasing with the large needles, the the columns of stitches are slanting as you go up; they're slanting to the right, and mm-hmm. my yarn is Z twisted. But let's say I spun a different yarn, same uh, same fiber that was S twisted, so twisted in the other direction. Mm-hmm. Then when I knit with them, they would slant going upwards to the left. And so I could actually get like a vertical chevroning pattern by doing a stripe, you know, like a two inches of the Z twist yarn and then two inches of the S twist yarn, two inches of the Z twist yarn, two inches of the S twist yarn. And I could get a pattern Mm -hmm. out of that, that slant. You know the the, hmm. the alternating slants. So yeah, really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So so that was, and then there's one more swatch that I made, and this one was on really large needles with the ever ever present, evergreen, never ending CVM. Oh yeah, <laughs> that I had pro- that six pounds of CVM that I had mm-hmm. processed. Actually, I think it started out as 12. Now I have only part of one six-pound bag left. Mm-hmm. So I spun this on the Salish spinner, the Indian head spinner. Mm-hmm. And it was woolen spun, whereas the rest of these were all mostly either true worsted or kind of partially worsted, where I was you know, keeping the, the fibers organized as I was spinning. Mm-hmm. This was spun totally woolen, where the the carded fibers are just feeding right into the wheel without any, without any straightening. So it's chunky yarn, probably an Aran weight, mm-hmm. very highly textured, not even, not an even yarn at all. Uh, very loose singles. This was not fulled at all. It was just taken right off the wheel uh, into a center pull ball. Mm-hmm. So I didn't even wash it before okay. I knitted with it. And then I washed the swatch afterwards. And it's mm-hmm. really nice. It's it's fluffy and light. It you know how your acorn trail sweater yes. is so light and fluffy? Yes. Yeah, is it's like that. Not very good stitch definition, which mm-hmm. is not surprising since it's a wool and spun yarn, but just really cushiony and uh, just very, very nice. So on that one we're talking about, how about the the pill factor? How do you think it would, uh, the durability of that yarn? I mean, what would be the use for it? Yeah, I think it would make, I think it would make a really nice blanket, uh, but not a blanket for super heavy wear, like, you know, not the blanket on your bed every night. Mm -hmm. Although actually, if you had it as a blanket on your bed every night, it would eventually probably just full and felt a little bit. Mm -hmm. If you wore it as a sweater, I would guess it would probably pill under the arms. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, but I think I'm going to use this. This is the kind of traditional yarn style for the Cowichan sweater. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that I did this swatch was because I wanted to see whether... I was going to use it as a singles the way they traditionally are made or if I was going to apply it. And I think, I don't know for sure what I'll do. I think I might apply it just to get a thicker yarn. I I probably could just practice a little bit more on my wheel and get a thicker singles. Mm -hmm. Um, But that wheel is is a little tricky to spin on and I haven't had enough practice. So I don't know, but I I really like this watch. I like how light, I mean, it's, it's, it's so featherweight. I mean, you can mm-hmm. barely feel this, and I think it would be a really nice, a nice garment. But yeah, you would have some pilling. Well, really interesting, 
And then, and I'm sorry, did I miss the, the, when you're talking about things biasing Mm -hmm. and you, and if you wash a a garment, if you were to make a a garment out Mm -hmm. of um, the yarn that's biasing and then when you wash it, it's now going to really, that energy is going to come back partially, right? Right. talking about that? Yes. What would you do? You just have to really aggressively block the, um, so you made a sweater, you would have to, or a blanket, you just, and it was biasing after you wash it, you just have to aggressively block it. Is that what you would do? I think what I would suggest is that you find a needle size that doesn't bias too much. Mm -hmm. That's what I would say, you know, and, and I remember reading something a long time ago and I could not find the reference. Um, but I remember reading something about how using singles, a lot of the success of using singles has to do with using the right size of needles, you know, using the right gauge so that you don't have to Mm -hmm. deal with the biasing. Okay. So that's that would be my first suggestion is to use the needle size that doesn't give you biasing. And in just about every swatch, there's a needle size that doesn't that doesn't bias either doesn't bias at all or doesn't bias much. Mm-hmm. Um, so that'd be the first thing. And then the other thing is maybe you don't want to use it for stockinette, like large oh, right. sections of stockinette garter yeah. or uh, some kind of pattern where you're you know doing different things. Um, I think would would help with that bias because I didn't see any biasing in the garter sections or in the lace and Mm -hmm. the swatch that I did with the CVM has a pattern to it, like a basket weave kind of pattern to it. And I don't see any biasing in that one either. Okay. So that would be a better way I think to handle the biasing. Don't use stockinette. First of all, use a needle size that, that, minimizes it or eliminates it and then don't use large sections of stockinette. Mm-hmm. Well, very interesting. So I'm, I'm excited to see the pictures. So is that, is that all the swatches yeah. that you did? Yeah. Those four? Okay. I did four swatches and a couple of the swatches had different needle sizes. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I have lots of pictures. I'll put, I'll put them all up and caption them and put a little bit of information. Cause I, I thought it was really cool. Yeah. Really interesting. Anything else about that or? No, that's, that's okay. pretty much the extent of my Swatchapalooza. Swatchapalooza. <laughs> <laughs> it was very fun. Well, Kelly, I have a little fiber in the wild. Oh, good. I don't want to talk politics. That's not what this podcast is about. However, I did watch and listen, or I didn't actually watch. I listened to both conventions. Uh-huh. I was listening to the NPR moderators discuss Hillary Clinton's uh, nomination acceptance speech. She hadn't given it yet, but they were talking about what she needed to do. And one of the announcers' comment was, she should just stick to her knitting. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm not quite sure what they meant by that. I don't know what that meant. I've never heard that phrase. It must um, be a saying. Yes, it must be a saying. I probably should have Googled uh, stick to her knitting and just see what they meant by that. Um, but, you know, anytime I hear the word knit, yarn, fiber, uh-huh. anything, I always um, have to just uh, comment on it. Well, so if, that was just kind of... If our listeners um, are in a part of the country where stick to your knitting is a saying, or if they had yeah. ancestors... Yes, yes. <laughs> Who used to say, stick to your knitting. <laughs> they can let us know what it means. Because <laughs> I'm pretty yeah. sure they didn't mean she needs to just stay out of politics and knit sweaters. No, I, I'm, sure that's not, I'm sure that's not what they meant. I was like, she should just stick to her plan, her program. I don't right, know. Right, right. Um, oh, uh, cool. And it was funny. I will say now, I, I, Kelly, I, it was kind of funny, too, because they were talking about um, uh, there's three styles of oratory. One is even though they're microphone, they are just shouting all mm-hmm. the time. The second one was, oh, now I can't even remember now what the second one was. But but they it, they were even commenting about different styles of oratory, which made me think about our podcast and how, you know, I'm often conscious sometimes when I listen back to myself, oh my gosh, you sound so croaky, or oh my gosh, <laughs> you repeat yourself, or oh my gosh, like don't say that. Why did you say that? Ah, you know. <laughs> Yes. And, uh, so uh-huh. thank, thank goodness the NPR uh, moderators are not listening to me. <laughs> or me. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to, um, this is not Fiber in the Wild, but I just wanted to update everybody that I've changed my uh, name on Ravelry. Yay. Um, and yay, on I'm Instagram excited. too. And, and on Instagram, on both of them. And so the one I selected after much discussion and uh, doodling and figuring out is I decided on Better in Motion. 
because I decided everything is better in motion and I'm busy all the time, right? All the things that I do, you know, well, the podcasting and gardening and cooking and knitting and crocheting and walking and time with the dog and all the stuff that I do, (laughs) it's all a form of motion. I was thinking too, that I'm never still, uh, even those moments where I think I'm going to be still, like I'm just going to go and watch something on TV. I'm always knitting. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to sit in the backyard and have a cup of tea. I'm knitting yeah. or spinning. So that's why I changed my name. So it's now I'm now better in motion. Cool. Yay. Yeah. Yeah. So that's all I have. Kelly, anything else that you have? Uh, I think that's all I need to say too. I know people always want an Enzo update and I, he's doing really, he's doing great. He's big. He's like 58 pounds now, I think. And we started another obedience class and he's doing really well. And I like this class better than the one I was doing before because they actually, the, the class has like a clear agenda, each mm-hmm. uh, class, what we're going to do. Um, and we actually are given a, um, the criteria to graduate from, you know, obedience one to obedience two to obedience three, um, and what, to, and, uh, what they need to do to test for the canine good citizenship nice. um, certificate. And they also have a, um, a program f- for therapy dogs, which is kind of cool. That is cool. And then, and then, what I really want to get into also is the agility. Um, and I have to tell you that I took him uh, a week ago. Thursday was his first class, and we got there a little bit early because I had to fill up some paperwork, and they needed his immunization records and all this stuff, and our vaccination records, I should say. They had the agility three class was in progress. He was so excited. And he, they have, the room is divided in half, um, and they have a low kind of concrete wall. It's about a three-foot-high concrete wall that separates the office area and where they're selling um, supplies, you know, like those, mm-hmm. the treat bag and stuff. And then the other side is where they're doing all the agility. And, Kelly, this is bad dog behavior, but it was so cute. He put his paws up on that wall. And I'm like, he had to look and see what was going on. And he was like, so, I mean, his demeanor changed completely when he saw those dogs. It it was like he he wanted to be part of the fun. Uh, These dogs were having so much fun and I want to have fun with them too. And they were, they were having so much fun. And then the second class I went to the obedience class, there's a woman who has a a dog that she just adopted about three weeks ago. It's an eight-year-old Chihuahua mix little teeny tiny dog. That dog must weigh five pounds or four pounds. Tiny little wow. dog. Anyway, which she's, she's doing the obedience and she's going to do agility with this little tiny dog. Oh, fun. And so I'm so excited to see this little tiny dog doing the agility. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. So the, the class that we did see the tail end, there was a standard poodle in the class. And it turns, I recognized the woman cause she lives in my neighborhood and I had met her dog named Tessa. Oh. And, um, so they were in the class and then they had, again, uh, they had a shepherd in there and then they also had some other, like a small dog, you know, like those little, uh, like a Shih Tzu or mm-hmm. small dog it was the, but they were all doing the, um, agility. So. I'm excited about that. Oh, that sounds fun. Really fun. You'll have to keep yes. us all posted. I'll have to keep you posted, and and when he and now it'll be a while till we start taking agility, but it'd be really fun if I can get some video of him. Oh, that would be cool. You know, yeah, yeah. Oh, so anyway, and that reminds me. Oh, we're never going to get off the phone, are we? I know. <laughs> One last thing, and then we'll go. Yes. Okay. That reminds me. I just wanted to tell our listeners that we are now also available on YouTube. Oh, right. Yes. Yeah. So it's not a video podcast. It's still an audio podcast. And I don't know how exciting that will be for people to listen on, on YouTube, but, but I know I occasionally will be on YouTube and and just listen. So if there are other Mm -hmm. people out there like that, that we are now also on YouTube. Okay. Well, I think maybe that is it. (laughs) (laughs) Are you sure? I'm sure. (laughs) All right. Well, I guess it's goodbye then. <laughs> that sounds so final. <laughs> I know. <laughs> All right, Kelly. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much for listening. To subscribe to the podcast, visit twousefiberadventures.com. We have links for iTunes, Google Play Music, YouTube, and others. Join us on our adventures on Ravelry and Instagram. I am Better in Motion, and Kelly is 100 Projects. Until next time, we're the two yous doing doing our our part part for World Fleece. Fleece.